29. The Tarantulas. In the previous chapters, we saw Zarathustra going after certain groups of people which, he believed, were detrimental to human happiness. But what does he have against tarantulas? Lo, this is the tarantula's den. Wouldst thou see the tarantula itself? Here hangeth its web. Touch this, so that it may tremble. There cometh the tarantula willingly. Welcome, tarantula. Black on thy back is thy triangle and symbol, and I know also what is in thy soul. Revenge is in thy soul. Wherever thou bitest, there ariseth black scab. With revenge thy poison maketh the soul giddy. The tarantulas, we see, are used here in order to invoke the famous myth about the effect of their bite. The name tarantula comes from the Italian town Taranto, where, in the 15th century, a weird phenomenon began, where people would show signs of heightened giddiness, which would eventually lead to insanity and death. It was blamed on the local spider's bite, and there would be more outbreaks of it in the next two centuries. The only cure was believed to be an ecstatic dance, dubbed the Tarantella, in which the afflicted would have to dance for hours to get the poison out. Zarathustra uses the tarantulas as a metaphor for a group of people who, driven by revenge, inject their poison into your veins, poison that makes you go giddy. Who are those malicious people he is talking about? Thus do I speak unto you in parable, ye who make the soul giddy, ye preachers of equality. Tarantulas are ye unto me, and secretly revengeful ones. But I will soon bring your hiding places to the light, therefore do I laugh in your face, my laughter of the height. Therefore do I tear at your web, that your rage may lure you out of your den of lies, and that your revenge may leap forth from behind your word, justice. Because for man to be redeemed from revenge, that is for me the bridge to the highest hope and a rainbow after long storms. The tarantulas are the people who preach equality between humans, from Rousseau to the socialists and all the other equity movements. Nietzsche never made much of a distinction between them, and regarded them as essentially the same, to the point where he rarely mentions any of the important socialist figures by name. Karl Marx isn't mentioned even once in his writings. But the metaphor of the tarantula shows that he acknowledges the power of what they are offering. The idea of equality is intoxicating to many people, who become entranced by it once they get bitten. Zarathustra, however, is not one of them. He claims that he sees these preachers of equality for what they are, and that they are actually driven not by a sense of justice, as they claim, but by the wish for revenge. The way he offers, on the other hand, is supposed to free us from such malevolent feelings towards others. He feels like his individual freedom and happiness have liberated him from any vengeful tendencies, and because of that, he is immune to the bite of the tarantulas. Otherwise, however, would the tarantulas have it. Let it be very justice for the world to become full of the storms of our vengeance. Thus do they talk to one another. Vengeance will we use, and insult against all who are not like us. Thus do the tarantula hearts pledge themselves. And will to equality, that itself shall henceforth be the name of virtue, and against all that hath power will we raise an outcry. The tarantulas are weak people who envy those who have power and greatness, and want to take revenge upon them by forcefully bringing them down to their level. Thus, they promote the idea of equality, to win over the masses and gain power that will allow them to do so. Ye preachers of equality, the tyrant frenzy of impotence crieth thus in you for equality. Your most secret tyrant longings disguise themselves thus in virtue words. Fretted conceit and suppressed envy, perhaps your father's conceit and envy, in you break they forth as flame and frenzy of vengeance. What the father hath hid cometh out in the sun, and oft have I found in the sun the father's revealed secret. This weakness and vengefulness, says Zarathustra, is something inherent in their nature, and their ideology comes from that. 
He speaks the language of race theory here, suggesting that it is hereditary. Race theory was the hot new thing at the time, and Nietzsche would occasionally double in it as well. Inspired ones they resemble, but it is not the heart that inspireth them, but vengeance, and when they become subtle and cold, it is not spirit, but envy that maketh them so. Their jealousy leadeth them also into thinkers' paths, and this is the sign of their jealousy. They always go too far, so that their fatigue hath at last to go to sleep on the snow. In all their lamentations soundeth vengeance, in all their eulogies is maleficence, and being judge seemeth to them bliss. It is easy to get the tarantulas wrong, warns Arthusto. They seem like good people, like those whose heart is in the right place. But they always end up exposing themselves, when their rhetoric against the have-mores goes too far. Then you realize that it is envy and vengeance that drives them. But thus do I counsel you, my friends. Distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. They are people of bad race and lineage. Out of their countenances peer the hangman and the sleuth-hound. One of the marks of these people is their desire to punish others, those who are not part of the herd mentality. Beware of such people. Distrust all those who talk much of their justice. Verily in their souls not only honey is lacking. And when they call themselves the good and just, forget not that for them to be Pharisees nothing is lacking but power. They appear to be fighting for justice. But once they will gain power, their true authoritarian nature will be revealed. Beware of giving them that power. My friends, I will not be mixed up and confounded with others. There are those who preach my doctrine of life and are at the same time preachers of equality and tarantulas. That they speak in favor of life, though they sit in their den, these poison spiders, and withdrawn from life is because they would thereby do injury. To those would they thereby do injury who have power at present, for with those the preaching of death is still most at home. Were it otherwise, then would the tarantulas teach otherwise, and they themselves were formerly the best world maligners and heretic burners. Zarathustra acknowledges that he shares something in common with many of these preachers of equality. Like him, Many of them are atheists, who are presuming to turn earthly life into paradise. But he vehemently refuses to be lumped in with them. Their thought does not affirm life, but rather wants to restrict and repress it. The only reason they emphasize their atheism is that those who are currently in power are the religious, and they want to overthrow them. If the atheists were in power, the tarantulas would probably be religious. With these preachers of equality will I not be mixed up and confounded, for thus speaketh justice unto me. Men are not equal, and neither shall they become so. What would be my love to the superman if I spake otherwise? Zarathustra rejects the basic premise of the tarantulas, the belief that all men are born equal, and it is society that creates the differences between them. We can never achieve greatness never get to the superman, if we adopt this belief. On a thousand bridges and piers shall they throng to the future, and always shall there be more war and inequality among them. Thus doth my great love make me speak. Inventors of figures and phantoms shall they be in their hostilities, and with those figures and phantoms shall they yet fight with each other the supreme fight. Good and evil, and rich and poor, and high and low, and all names of values. Weapons shall they be, and sounding signs that life must again and again surpass itself. We need hierarchies, says Zarathustra. This is what drives people to climb up and achieve greatness, and this is what creates the strife that fuels our strive for greatness. Equality will just lead to staidness and decay. Aloft will it build itself with columns and stairs, Life itself into remote distances would it gaze, and out towards blissful beauties. Therefore doth it require elevation. And because it requireth elevation, therefore doth it require steps, 
and variance of steps and climbers. To rise striveth life, and in rising to surpass itself. The driving force of life is the will to surpass what you are now. This is an idea that will be more fully developed later, but here is preemptively mentioned to explain why it is important to create values that drive us to strive for greater heights. The tarantulas are killing this strive. And just behold, my friends, here where the tarantula's den is riseth aloft an ancient temple's ruins. Just behold it with enlightened eyes. Verily, he who here towered aloft his thoughts in stone knew as well as the wisest ones about the secret of life, that there is struggle and inequality even in beauty, and war for power and supremacy. That doth he here teach us in the plainest parable. How divinely do vault and arch here contrast in the struggle, how with light and shade they strive against each other, the divinely striving ones. Zarathustra looks at the beautiful things that human civilization has created, and in all of them he sees the strive for greatness, which arose out of competitiveness and struggle. If the tarantulas had their way, there would be no beauty in our world. Thus, steadfast and beautiful, let us also be enemies, my friends. Divinely will we strive against one another. Alas, there hath the tarantula bit me myself, mine old enemy. Divinely steadfast and beautiful, it hath bit me on the finger. Punishment must there be, and justice. So thinketh it, not gratuitously shall he here sing songs in honor of enmity. In his gushing about the greatness of a society where everyone competes with each other and creates divine beauty, Zarathustra realizes that he, too, has sinned by wanting equality. It is not entirely clear what he means, but I think he means that he started dreaming of a society where everyone is a superman, where the small men no longer exist. The thought intoxicates him. Yea, it hath revenged itself, and alas, now will it make my soul also dizzy with revenge. That I may not turn dizzy, however, bind me fast, my friends, to this pillar. Rather will I be a pillar saint than a whirl of vengeance, Verily no cyclone or whirlwind is Zarathustra, and if he be a dancer, he is not at all a tarantula dancer. Thus spake Zarathustra. Zarathustra does not want to become like the tarantulas, and he is afraid that if he goes down this path, he will start thinking vengeful thoughts against those who prevent us from becoming supermen. Mixing metaphors, he asks us to bind him to the pillar, to prevent him from dancing the tarantella. This invokes Ulysses, who asks to be bound to the pillar so he can hear the siren song, but not be tempted by it to his death. He admits that this idea that took over his mind, the idea of a society where everyone is equal in their greatness, is like a siren song to him, very hard to resist. He wants to keep on listening to it, to be inspired by it, because this is what makes him dance the kind of dance that he likes, the dance on mountaintops but he also realizes that it might make him vengeful against those who repress it. If he wants to prevent his joyful dance from becoming a tarantella, he is going to have to find the right balance.